May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with the treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. With so many great readings appointed for this Sunday, I must admit that as a preacher, I was completely spoiled for choice when it came to choosing a passage to preach on. Yet I found these words of Jesus from Luke's gospel to be positively inescapable this week as I thought about this sermon. And that's because in these three short verses, Jesus manages to capture the entire weight of what Christianity says both about us and about God. About us that under the power of sin, Our human hearts are at best weak and frail and incredibly deceptive at worst. And about God that in spite of this, in spite of what's true about us and our hearts, that God delights in saving us. Now the reason that these verses strike at these core issues is that they come at the end of a long discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples and some bystanders about money and God. So, you know, the reason your mother told you to never talk about money or religion at a dinner party is that they both have this kind of uncanny ability to reveal the truth about who we are and what we value. And so in this discussion, Jesus is trying to get the disciples and the crowd around him to see that the life he's offering to those who follow him is a life that's free of the control that money so often exerts over us. So first, as we read last week, Jesus tells a parable about the futility of gathering up wealth for yourself. The story of a man who builds more and more barns to store his crops and his grain and all of his stuff, but then suddenly dies in the night and can't take any of it with him. And after this, Jesus tells his disciples that they're not to be anxious about having food or clothing. He says that life consists in more than these things. He points to nature how birds and plants get all that they need to live from God. And that he asked them if God would provide like this for the grass, which is here one day and thrown in the fire the next, then how much more will God provide for them? And right before our passage this morning, Jesus tells the disciples that their first task is to seek the kingdom of God and that God will then provide for all of their needs. Jesus is laying out a life of radical trust in God, a life lived with the kind of trust where it's possible to do what Jesus suggests in our reading today, to sell your possessions and to give to the needy, to provide ourselves with money bags that do not grow old, but with a treasure in the heavens that's unfailing. Jesus is saying that a life of true freedom is one where we trust God's provision enough that we can give our stuff away without being worried about ourselves. And I don't know about you, but That kind of life sounds pretty great to me. So think for a minute about how many of our decisions are all based on our worry or fear that we won't have enough. Think about how many hours of sleep you've lost worrying about this stuff, about paying the bills, about retirement accounts, about affording the kids' education. And while we often think that more money would just kind of stop these questions, the truth is is that no matter what tax bracket you find yourself in, these same basic questions keep reappearing, even if they take just a different form. We all, in our own way, worry about whether or not we are going to have enough. But how nice would it be to not worry about those things? How nice would it be to be able to quiet all of those fears and anxieties that bounce around in our minds time and time again? How nice would it be to be able to rest in God's provision for us. Well, it would be amazing. But the trouble is that any respite we seem to get from these questions is fleeting at best. That those brief moments of truly trusting God are quickly undone by this undercurrent of fear 
that runs through our fallen hearts. So Jesus sums up this long discussion on money in one sentence. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And in this one sentence, Jesus reveals the true source of our struggle between trust and fear. It's our hearts. And Jesus is tapping into this constant theme we see throughout the Bible, which is that our relationship with God is first and foremost a matter of the heart. So in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, God promises to take his people's hearts, which are of stone, and to give them instead a heart of flesh. In a similar promise in Jeremiah, he tells his people that he one day will write his law on their hearts, not just on stone tablets. And in the Gospels, we see Jesus criticizing the Pharisees for thinking that their relationship with God was one where they simply had to do external stuff and keep a written law code. And he says to them that if they've ever hated someone, well, they were guilty of murder. And if they'd ever lusted after someone, even in their heart, they were guilty of adultery. Jesus says that sin isn't caused by things outside of us, but it comes from within us, from our hearts. In 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to the Christians in Corinth as being a letter from Christ that's written by the Spirit of God on the tablets of their fleshy hearts. So it's no surprise that Jesus takes this whole conversation about money and God and what we value in life and brings it back to the main issue, our heart. So when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, he's saying that our life really consists in the things that we love. He's saying that what we love shapes how we live, that what we love shapes how we think and what we say and what we do. And that means that he's also saying that if you look at the things that we think and what we say and what we do, then we can actually see what we truly value in our hearts. And unsurprisingly, because Jesus is God after all, he's exactly right about this. So just think about how this works in your relationships with other people. So think of any person that you love or care about, be it a spouse or a child or a parent or a friend. And in any relationship like that, you quickly realize that what you think and what you do and your choices start to be shaped by your love for that other person. So think about how this works in marriage. All of a sudden, your decisions about what you spend money on, how you spend your time, they start to change because you love your spouse. It even teaches you what to do with a toilet seat and the proper way to handle that. Your love for your spouse has a way of shaping how you live. And think about as a parent. Think about what parents sacrifice for their children. When they're infants, hours of sleep, willingly, money, time. Kids are expensive. But if you're a parent, you know you do it gladly because you do it out of love. Or think about a good friend who calls you who's had an absolutely dreadful day. You don't sit around for 30 minutes and, you know, say, hey, can I call you back and let me think about whether I'm going to come over and spend time with you tonight? No, you just go because you care about them. So when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's saying that if your heart is set on the kingdom, that if it's set on God's character as a merciful and gracious provider, then you'll start to live in light of that. You'll start to live free from the fears and anxieties that so often beset us and control us in this world. But while a heart that's set on God brings us freedom from these anxieties, the problem is that so often we find that our hearts are set on the wrong things, on the things that we think that we need to have enough, on the things we think, if we get them, will calm our fears and our anxieties. And we find that those things are actually what's shaping how we live. Because you see, if we operate off the principle that Jesus is laying out here, what we do, what we spend our time on, and our energy and our money, is actually what we value. What we spend our time thinking and doing reveals to us what we treasure. So then, how often do our thoughts or words or actions make it clear that the only thing that we really love is ourselves? How often do we behave like we're the only person in the world who actually matters? 
How often do our actions show that our treasure is really an earthly one? A treasure of money or popularity or success or esteem. A treasure of having our own desires met, no matter what it might cost other people. Any honest assessment of the state of our hearts will show that under our own power, we're not even capable of trusting God in this way that Jesus describes at all. It'll show that even for believing and professing followers of Jesus, that there is a spiritual war between trust and fear that rages within each of us. It's the kind of war that St. Paul speaks of where that within us, which is born of God's spirit, is in conflict with that within us, which is born of sin. A war where, as he puts it in the fifth chapter of Galatians, the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. Paul describes his and our experience of this war in Romans chapter 7 by saying that we can even desire to do what is right, but not be able to actually do it. Meaning that we can even know and want to trust God fully, but that we lack the power on our own to actually trust him in that way. And this is why so much of the Christian life is lived vacillating between faith and fear, between belief and doubt, between trusting in God's sufficiency and then white-knuckling our way through life as if we are the only person that we can rely on. And Paul ends his lament of this reality of life in Romans 7 with an exasperated question. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And this morning, that's our question too. Who will deliver us? Is there someone who can save us from our fears and anxieties? Is there a power that can deliver us from our untrusting hearts? The answer is that yes, there is. And that yes is found in Jesus' first words of our gospel passage. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here we see Jesus stepping into the midst of that spiritual war that rages within each of us and shouting, do not be afraid. And Jesus saying, do not be afraid, is very different from anyone else saying it. It's not the kind of platitude that we tell one another to try and momentarily pacify our anxieties. You know what I'm talking about. When you're afraid or anxious and someone just tells you to calm down, and you know, if you could calm down, you would, right? No, that's not what's going on with Jesus in this case. Because this is like that time when the disciples get caught in a violent storm while they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee and fearing for their lives, They wake Jesus up, who's asleep in the boat, in order for him to do something about it. And with three words, Jesus makes the storm stop. Jesus saying, do not be afraid, is the author of life, God in the flesh, standing in the middle of the stormy sea that this life so often feels like, and saying to the wind and the waves, peace, be still. And then they are. After Jesus calms the storm in this account, the disciples then marvel that the wind and the waves obey Jesus' voice. And the voice of Jesus has the power not only to calm the storms of our own fears and anxieties, but even to take our untrusting hearts and create true faith and trust in them. And these words of Jesus have power because they're rooted in God's desire to save us. So Jesus tells us to not be afraid because it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. But notice exactly what Jesus says. First, Jesus calls those there and us, by extension, his little flock. Meaning that if we're his flock, Jesus is calling himself our shepherd. Jesus is showing us his own heart towards us that he will provide for us and care for us, that he is the one who will protect us and guard us from all harm. 
And then notice how Jesus refers to God. He says, your father. Literally, he says, y'all's father. He doesn't say, the father, which he could. He doesn't say, my father, which he also could say. He says, your father. And in those two words, Jesus is showing us what kind of relationship those that are in his flock have with God. That he's not just Jesus' father, but that he's our father too. And lastly, notice what Jesus says about God giving us the kingdom. He says that it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You could even translate this as your father delights to choose to give you the kingdom. So not only is Jesus saying that it's God's work alone to bring about his kingdom on earth, that it's not up to us, thankfully, but he's also saying that God delights and takes joy in giving his kingdom to us. He's saying that God saves us not out of some kind of internal sense of duty or obligation that God has to us, but that God saves us because he finds delight and joy in saving and redeeming sinful people like you and me. That it makes our Father glad to see his work in our hearts, to see his mercy and forgiveness towards us in his son Jesus, creating faith and trust where there once was none. That God takes joy in fixing our hearts on the only treasure that has the power to bring us true and lasting peace, himself. So fear not, little flock, for your father delights to give you the kingdom. Your father delights to give you peace, and your father delights to save you. Amen.